Well, thank you all for coming very, very much. I really appreciate it. Um, so I'm on my way back from four years in Estonia, uh, back to NCIS headquarters um, as cyber analyst there. And uh, uh, so I I'm, uh, really haven't been back to Washington uh, really yet. And so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm without a computer and a cell phone and, and a lot of things. But before I left, I was able to uh, published this book and it's available as a f free download from the Cyber Center site and if you want a copy of the hard copy I'm sure I can get a copy to at least your organization. Uh, so uh, so today in, in, in Syria, right, if you're watching the news, uh, there is literally a, a war going on between uh, the government and, and, and the people. And, you know, the, the, the thing about cyber war being a, a lot of hype is, uh, is true uh, in many contexts, but, but I think that, that if, if you think about it uh, from the perspective of so many people around the world, it, it literally is a matter of life and death every day. And so in Syria, even just in the New York Times following the, you know, just the headlines, you can see that when when the, uh, um, when the activity started, basically the NGOs were trying to sneak in uh, satellite phones. And then uh, that was a victory, but then a week or two later, the government had figured out how to, to turn them off. And so, you know, it's a game of cat and mouse, but, but really, uh, this stuff shouldn't be taken lightly. I think it's, it's quite, quite serious, and, and uh, uh, for, for millions of people around the world, it, it is truly a life and death issue. And, uh, you know, we're fortunate to be here uh, at such an event where we can uh, do all this stuff uh, in, front of, in front of the media. Uh, so there is also in Aspen, Colorado today, there is a group meeting called the Aspen Group. And these are people, uh, Madeleine Albright, uh, Colin Powell, uh, kings and queens show up at this event as well, and they discuss national security issues. And they're meeting today. Uh, and I'll let you guess what the topic is at this year's uh, meeting. Uh, it's not goat herding, it is cyber. And uh, so I had a chance this week to look at their, their uh, topics of discussion and, uh, you know, as you can imagine, at this level, these are all academics and diplomats, and the theme was the peace of Westphalia, right? I don't know how many historians we have here. I don't know a lot about the peace of Westphalia, but, you know, basically it was the first modern diplomatic conference that sort of ended the 30 and 80 years war, and it was sort of the foundation of one of the found big pieces uh, founding uh, the modern nation state. And so, you know, creating discrete blocks that were governed by uh, governments. And so, uh, one of the papers they're going to discuss is a, a recently released paper from MIT, I guess it's uh, Mallory, perhaps professor there, in which he talks about um, tagging packets on the internet uh, according to their country of origin, uh, crypt cryptographically, so that you, you can more quickly tell uh, which countries are responsible for bad behavior online. And I'm just passing this to you. Uh, this is today also what the senior foreign policy and national security thinkers in the country are discussing today. Uh, so. Uh, and I'm going back to NCIS, and, and, and they asked me to say that we have at least five open in, uh, cyber intelligence positions in Washington, D.C., so you can get in contact with me if you're interested uh, in working in Washington. Uh, so a little bit about me. Uh, I was a, a signals intelligence guy in, in, uh, since 93 for DOD. I did French and Russian language, and then I sort of switched over to cyber. Uh, and then went to NCIS and did a tour four years in Estonia at the NATO Cyber Center. And I strongly believe that, the, uh, that NATO and or the EU uh, will play a major role in, in the future of cyberspace. And the reason is, is because it's a large group of affluent countries uh, that have serious assets, serious uh, expertise, uh, and they're on the same political military agenda to a large degree. In fact, in Afghanistan, right, they have 50,000 soldiers that, that uh, part of ISAF uh, that are fighting a war. And when you fight a war together, obviously you're going to, to share a lot of secrets and uh, try and uh, uh, mitigate various threats. Uh, and, and, I, and I strongly believe that, well, it, 
because the, the cyber sort of security problem, at least from a national security perspective, is, is an international problem. I work for NCIS, and of course, every time you want to do an investigation, the first thing you see are, are tons of foreign IP addresses, right? So then you're stuck with dealing with the law enforcement or counterintelligence organizations of another country, uh, and before you can uh, proceed, uh, unless you want to take, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, measures that might be illegal yourself. So, all conflicts today have some kind of a cyber dimension, and that's because we're all using the internet, whether you're sort of a, a student, a soldier, a spy, a diplomat, a politician, or a televangelist, right? You're using the internet, uh, and so uh, spies and soldiers are no different. In fact, they're ahead of the game. They've got more resources and more engineers uh, and more kinds of attacks because they've got signals intelligence, they have human, in human intelligence, uh, and they have, they've got this, there's a difference, you know, the APT, the Advanced Persistent Threat, the difference between a lone hacker, even a hacker group, and the APT is that these are organizations that have a mission to attack you. So if somebody in that organization gets sick or goes on leave or retires or dies, somebody else sits in their seat, right? And they have, you know, a bonus, they have retirement and all this, and that's what makes it the APT, right? There's, there's, not, there's not going to be a time that the intelligence service of country X is not targeting the intelligence service of, or the government of country Y. But nobody knows how big of a, of, a, of a threat cyber war and cyber terror are. In fact, there's a lot of hype, uh, and there's a lot of arcane tools and tactics that politicians uh, don't understand and they're speaking about uh, without sort of connecting the tactics and strategy of, of cyber. Uh, but the, this talk is going to be about strategic uh, solutions and so uh, I think it's a, you know, Cybersecurity has essentially evolved from a tactical, technical discipline to this big strategic concept that, that politicians can understand. Uh, and they, instead of managing one, ten, or even a thousand computers, have to think about millions of computers. There's about 400 million computers in the United States that are connected to the Internet. And so it's a lot like alcoholism or you know, the drug policy or education or something, you know, you're trying to think about how to uh, um, come up with national solutions to this. And so that's what we'll look at. These are a combination of different mixtures of technical, political, and military. But I'm trying to think if you're sitting in the White House or you're sitting in the biggest office at the Pentagon with a window, uh, you know, how you're thinking about cybersecurity. Uh, and I think uh, IPv6 is, is, is one of the possible solutions that you're looking at. I think basically updating military doctrine in accordance with the best of our understanding of military doctrine, i.e. Uh, Sun Tzu. Uh, you're, you're trying to deter cyber attacks. You're trying to threaten either to, to deny someone the ability to attack you or to punish them for attacking you. Uh, and you're trying to articulate that to your adversary, which is deterrence. Uh, and then arms control. Is it possible to limit the spread of cyber weapons? And so these are four different strategies. And what I want to do in this research is just look at them individually and then try and prioritize them. If you had a hundred dollars to spend on these four strategies, how would you uh, divide that money up? So the book uh, basically has uh, five parts and uh, and it's in the beginning I talk about the history of, of computer security and I start in 1837 uh, when uh, Charles Babbage at uh, Cambridge University uh, first designed the analytical engine that was never built because it was about a hundred years ahead of its time uh, and so uh, moving really uh, past World War II when you had examples of really powerful computers that demonstrated, you know, the, the UNIVAC, uh, you know, basically saying uh, with 1% of the, you know, sample of the United States population, you could predict the winner. In fact, it, it did. Uh, so I talk about a, a little bit about my background as a, as a cybersecurity analyst and the challenges uh, there, and in particular some big events like in Estonia last year we did a, a seven country. Uh, there was over 100 engineers involved. It took us about a year, and I got to be the analyst to it. It was called Baltic Cyber Shield, and we did a terrorist scenario against uh, power plants. Uh, and so we had uh, seven uh, blue teams uh, from northern Europe, and then we had a, a red team of 20 hackers uh, trying to basically turn off turn off the lights. 
Uh, and so uh, in the real world impact, I talk a lot about internal security, and that's where it all starts, I think, and, and it's, it's never clearer than if you look at Belarus, Zimbabwe, Turkmenistan, China, North Korea, countries where there is a high level of tension between government and civil society on the internet. There's plenty to look at to understand how on a daily basis cybersecurity really, really matters. And governments like in Belarus, for instance, every time there's an election, basically, you know, the opposition supporters and the opposition parties can't speak to each other because they either turn off the internet or they make it so slow that uh, your packets basically uh, it takes five, ten minutes uh, to load. Uh, so then I look at the strategies, uh, technical, military, and, and, and political, and I use this thing called, this is developed in Switzerland called the De Decision Making uh, Trial and Evaluation Laboratory. It's really, really simple mathematics. You just, you just try and uh, put things on the table and push them around and sort them until you, you see uh, which are the most influential pieces on the table. And then that's where, uh, in part, you could place your money. You want to see, you know, if, if you, your goal is to get from here to there, uh, which, which, which pieces are more influential or more dominant in the system than others. Uh, and in particular, Demetel calculates indirect influence. And they just does that through a simple matrix uh, mathematical calculation. So if A affects B, uh, but B affects C, well, how does A affect C? And that's what Demetel does very quickly for you. Uh, so IPv6 being a technical solution, art of war, purely military. And then the other two are sort of hybrid. And I think this is interesting. Uh, deterrence, I think, is military political and arms control political uh, technical. And this has implications, I think, which, which uh, you'll see later uh, in, in the presentation. Well, IPv6, right? So this is, um, as a tech, you know, after doing this research, I, I really think that it was never more clear to me that a technical problem needs a technical solution. Um, it sounds intuitive, but if you have a, a, you know, a cybersecurity problem, but then your first inclination is to sign a political agreement not to attack each other, it really doesn't get you very far, does it? Right? Because you are, uh, you're relying on the, you know, the current events, you're relying on you know, rationality and uh, diplomacy, etc. So just this morning, actually, on the History Channel, as I woke up, they were talking about the sale of F-14s to, uh, to Iran uh, in, the, in the 70s, and this was a big deal because, you know, these were the most advanced, you know, fancy planes in existence, and we decided to sell, you know, I think 79 of them to, to, uh, to Iran, and then they had a revolution, right? And so, all of a sudden, these planes that we had intended to be sort of, you know, hedging against the Soviet Union, all of a sudden, we were trying to figure out how to destroy them. So, uh, with IPv6, I think it's, the beauty of it is that it's a technical solution, or it's a proposed solution to a technical problem. And what's the, what's the problem? Okay, with IPv4, uh, you know, it was chosen because it was simple and easy to manage. It didn't have the fancy, uh, you know, attributes of some of its rivals, it, IP1, uh, because it was it was simple and easy to manage. Well, IPv4 okay has uh, is great, but it has flaws. Nothing is perfect. Neither is IPv6, by the way. But uh, with IPv6, one of the things you have is you have defined within the protocol IPsec. Uh, so you have a greater with to a greater degree uh, with uh, native uh, abilities, you can authenticate and encrypt. Uh, and that's why the Pentagon and China, you know, are very interested in, in IPv6. When you, now from the Pentagon's perspective, when you launch a satellite into outer space, you have to think at least eight years in advance, right? And so these have all been IPv6, IPv6 capable for a long time. And uh, uh, but basically, you know, from the American perspective, uh, to quote one of our generals, he said, you know, in, in the future with IPv6, anything with an electron will 